Welcome. I'm Sherry Vale. I'm the Dean of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I want to welcome you all to our second speaker in the Celine Lecture Series today. We're very thankful to the Celine family for supporting the Celine Lecture Series. We have a final appearance coming up uh, next Thursday in this room at about 1230. I believe uh, Celeste Comte is going to come in via Zoom for that session. She'll be coming to us from Chicago Public Media and formerly of ProPublica. Rex Celine and his family set up the S. Allen and Kathleen D. Celine Memorial Lectureship in honor of his parents. Rex graduated from our college in 1978 and went on to a distinguished editing and reporting career at publications like the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the Miami Herald, the New York Times, and a few other newspapers. His niece, Libby Celine, graduated from our college just here in 2021. And she actually worked uh, with the New York Times as part of the COVID coverage that earned a Pulitzer Prize. So look at what can happen when you come out of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications. Now Libby works as a data visualization reporter for the San Antonio Express News by way of Hearst Texas Development Hub, a data visualization team serving San Antonio and Houston. The family's intention in setting up this fund was to expose Nebraska students to recognize leaders in the field. They want students to look up at the horizon, the big picture and beyond their daily challenges in school. They want you to see what the future can hold. And that's really where the Celine lecture has worked out so well in Professor's we Professor Weber's class because we're looking at the changing business models of news the future of journalism. So now I will turn it over to Professor Weber to introduce, introduce our speaker. Thanks very much, Dean. I do appreciate that. Um, come on out, Larry. Here, stand here. The light should be on you. Uh, we are really privileged to have Larry Rickman with us today. Um, he's been visiting with um, some other classes, and I've had a chance to listen to the story of the development of the Colorado Sun absolutely riveting and you should press him on that if he doesn't address it so much. We'll see what happens. Um, he's editor and co-founder of the Colorado Sun, which is a digital news site founded in 2018. If you haven't looked it up yet, go online and check out the Colorado Sun. It's well worth reading even if you are not from Colorado. Um, previously, he was senior editor at the Denver Post, managing editor at the Gazette in Colorado Springs, and city editor at the Greeley Tribune. Before that, he spent 22 years at the Associated Press in very impressive positions. He was assistant managing editor. He was a national editor and supervisor of the AP's national desk in New York. He spent nearly four years as a Moscow correspondent for AP, where he helped to cover the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of the new Russia. He also supervised AP's coverage of the Columbine High School Massacre and directed AP's coverage of the presidential election recount in Florida in 2000, which was a seminal event in our uh, recent electoral, electoral history. So without further ado, Larry Rickman. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the dean who graciously showed me around this amazing facility you guys have here today. Uh, all that stuff that he's told you just means I'm really old. You know, and you stick around long enough, you have a chance to, to do a few things. And, um, you know, it, in, in talking to students and faculty today, I was reminded uh, when I was a journalism student, like yourselves, uh, 40 years or so ago, and a professional journalist, some of you have heard me say, tell this story earlier today, but a professional journalist came to one of my classes and, uh, and basically said, look, don't take this personally, don't do it. Don't get into this business, newspapers are dying, there's no future in this business, and you know, I did what uh, any uh, headstrong college student should do. I rolled my eyes, ignored him, and did it anyway. And uh, for me, it was, a, it was a great move. You know, it, uh, as, as mentioned here, I've had an opportunity to do you know, some really amazing things. I've walked the halls of the Kremlin. 
Um, I have crawled in the tunnels beneath uh, Alcatraz for a fun story. I've been to Carnegie Hall and um, interviewed just amazing people, historical figures, Mikhail Gorbachev and, and others. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun, but you know that, that journalist uh, 40 years ago wasn't entirely wrong. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that whether he had a crystal ball or, or what, but um, it's, been a, it's been a tough time. I mean, um, we've seen an incredible decline in, uh, with the legacy newspapers uh, in, in particular. Um, but uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, there is cause for hope. Uh, I'm an irrepressible optimist. You kind of have to be to start a new business, whether it's a coffee shop or, God forbid, uh, a media organiz organization uh, like mine. Um, I, will, uh, I will tell you all about uh, what gives me uh, hope for the future. I will say that um, what we do is, is absolutely uh, important. You know, unlike a coffee shop or, uh, or some other business, what we're what we're all about here in this room and, and elsewhere is, you know, it's core to our very democracy. I'm going to get up on my soapbox here and talk about, you know, why it's why it's important that we're here. Uh, there is a reason that uh, freedom of the press is enshrined in the very first amendment uh, to the Constitution. You know, back in the day, uh, newspapers were were pretty tough on the founding fathers, you know, Tom, including Thomas Jefferson, and not necessarily without uh, cause uh, in some cases. But you know, they were very partisan attacks uh, on both sides. Uh, Jefferson wasn't necessarily a fan of newspapers, but and you guys have probably seen the quote. It's probably on a, on one of your walls around here about, you know, if I could choose government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I wouldn't hesitate to to choose the latter. And um, he understood that, and, and I would say Vladimir Putin understands this as well, that uh, a free press is, is the foundation of a healthy democracy. You know, Putin, of course, has no interest uh, in having that, you know, quite to the contrary. He wants to tightly control information. But um, what we're doing is, is important. As, as uh, Professor mentioned, you know, I spent some time in Russia during very tumultuous times. Uh, I was there in October of 1993 when uh, Boris Yeltsin, the president then of Russia, sent tanks against his own White House uh, because there were people inside the White House who wanted to put the Soviet Union back together. And, um, you know, Yeltsin sent tanks to, uh, to flush them out of the White House. We were so close in the AP Bureau that we had to close our windows because smoke from the White House was pouring into the office. Uh, that's how close we were. So um, we were, but we, I was there to be a witness to history. You know, you've. Uh, that's how close we were. So um, <laughs> I was there to be a witness to history. Hopefully you loved it the first time. The second time's even better. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, there is, uh, as I said, was saying the, the journalist 40 years ago was, you know, all gloom and doom. And newspapers have always, it's always been a tough business. It just has. But there's never been a time when we needed uh, a free press and journalists more than today. I will get into the grim stuff, though. Uh, since 2004, about 1,800 newspapers have closed in the United States. More than 100 local newsrooms closed just during the pandemic. We've seen countless furloughs and layoffs, and many newspapers have become a shadow of their former selves. You've, you've heard the expression, news deserts are spreading around the country, places where people have lost access to trusted local news sources. Here in Nebraska, you've seen layoffs at the Omaha World Herald, the Scotts Bluff Star Herald, the Grand Island Independent, and others. In Colorado, at my former newspaper, the Denver Post once upon a time had 307 journalists at its peak. Uh, its rival, just a couple of blocks away, the Rocky Mountain News, had about the same number of journalists. Well, the Rocky's been closed for 10 years now. The Denver Post, from a high of 307, is now down to maybe 55. It's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a tough time there. A professor at the University of North Carolina says that nationally, the pace of closures has been about 100 a year, newspaper closures. So why does it matter? You know, what about 
the job losses when department stores close or or when restaurants or factories close. I mean, it's sad when anybody loses their job. I mean, it is. I've seen a lot of friends and colleagues uh, lose their jobs. But newspapers, media companies are not like restaurants and factories and shoe stores. As I said, they are a, a pillar of our free democracy. You know, the, the difference is, you know, who's left to cover, it's who's left to cover the school boards? Who's left to hold the police and state officials accountable? You know, we'll never know. The tragedy is we'll never know the stories that aren't being told because there wasn't a journalist there to tell them. You know, who is left to spend thousands of dollars on public records requests? Who's left to sit through trials and cover uh, committee hearings, city councils? Those kinds of things happen because journalists are in the room. And uh, that's, uh, that's what we've lost. In fact, most journalists I know are pretty capable people who are able to go off and get other jobs. It's the communities that lose most when journalism jobs go away. Bear with me. As you know, the Washington Post declares on its front page that democracy dies in darkness. I would say that it also thrives in the sunlight. That's not just a Colorado Sun pun here, as much as I love them. Um, you know, the effects of journalism, uh, the effects of journalism decline on communities can actually be measured in dollars and cents. And you guys may have seen some of this research. The government costs rise when newspapers go away and when coverage goes away. Health officials even uh, are left, uh, you know, are left in the dark. Uh, they often depend on newspapers to be sort of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to disease outbreaks and whatnot. So we all have a stake in the future of journalism. That all can sound pretty grim and sometimes it is. The hedge fund that now controls hundreds of our news top newspapers, of our nation's top newspapers, they've done enormous harm in the past 10 years. But I'm, I'm here to tell you there's hope. I am, as I said before, I'm an irrepressible optimist, and you pretty much have to be. In Denver recently, and by the way, I don't know if any of you follow Ken Doctor uh, on Twitter or read him, his stuff online. Ken is uh, one of the, probably the preeminent media analyst around the country. Ken um, runs now uh, another digital startup called Lookout Santa Cruz. And uh, recently in Denver, I convened a group of like-minded uh, digital startups. So it was Lookout Santa Cruz, um, the Daily Memphian in Tennessee, uh, the Long Beach Post, and our friends at Block Club Chicago. And uh, we kind of called it the 3 a.m. support group. You know, what do you, when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning when you run one of these digital news organizations, what are you thinking about? How can we help each other? And Ken wrote about that today at Pointer. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, take a look at that, uh, you might. But I would say just, we all have different business models. You know, some of us are nonprofit. The Colorado Sun, my organization, is a public benefit corporation. Some are for profit. And we finally, you know, decided that, look, tax status isn't that important. If, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with making money. We live in a capitalist society. But if you're all about making money, if that's the only thing that matters to you, if you're all in global capital, you know, maybe maybe that's not the the right uh, that's not the right model. Not not for society. Not for democracy. Let me just tell you about the story uh, of the founding of the uh, of the Colorado Sun back in 2018. Uh, four years ago, I was senior editor, as uh, as professor, the professor mentioned. Um, w the newsroom again had been 307 at the height, with about 100 at the start of 2018. Uh, we were in the iconic, uh, beautiful, big white Denver Post building in downtown uh, Denver, right across the street from the state capitol, across the street from the Supreme Court, across the street from Denver City Hall. It was sort of the it's the center of power in Colorado. Um, we were ordered to move out of the building. Alden was going to Alden Global Capital was going to get rid of uh, get rid of the newsroom, move it out to the to the printing plant out in suburban Denver, and uh, many of us felt like, meh, you know what? We worked in worse places than a printing plant. Uh, if it saves jobs, that's fine. Well, just weeks later, we were ordered to lay off another one third of our staff, and that's when I decided, and and nine of my top colleagues decided to that there had to be a better way. You know, that uh, 
journalism was too important to be left in the hands of hedge funds. So we left, and we created this little pirate ship we decided to call the Colorado Sun. And um, we, uh, it, was, it was a roll of the dice, I will tell you, you know, talking about new business models. We were flying without a net. We walked out with no health insurance and no guarantee of a job. As you may know, most startups, whether it's in media or anything else, coffee shop, uh, fail after the first year or two. You know, we knew the stakes were pretty high for all of us, but we felt it was just too important to, uh, to do nothing and watch, uh, watch Alden dismantle another proud newsroom. So we left, and uh, here we are four years later. We, have, uh, we started off with 10 full-time staff members at the Colorado Sun. Today we have a staff of 25. We had zero subscribers and zero paying members uh, four years ago. Today we have 210,000. Uh, newsletter subscribers. We have more than 16,000 paying members, and we're growing every day. And if, if, uh, if I may, uh, just last weekend, um, this was kind of fun. So um, we had uh, uh, an award ceremony for the Society of Professional Journalists Top of the Rockies competition. It's four states, and you know we go up against uh, each other. It's kind of fun. Just for fun, the Colorado Sun, we entered into the extra large newsroom category. A little Colorado Sun with a staff of 25. We went up against the best of the best in our four state region. We took home 28 awards. Our closest competitor in Colorado, Colorado Public Radio and the Denver uh, and um, Colorado Springs Gazette took home 11. So once upon a time, the Denver Post uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of Columbine. On my staff at the Colorado Sun, we have more people who covered Columbine, including myself, than the Post does. So, you know, we decided that, look, if the old model at the Denver Post and other legacy newspapers around the country wasn't going to support quality journalism, that we needed to come up with a new model. And, you know, what does the old model look like? You know, forever newspapers have been supported by advertising. And, and for the record, by the way, I'm not, I'm not anti-advertising. I'm, I'm anti-bad advertising. And, and we all know what, a, what bad advertising looks like, at least from my perspective pop-up ads, uh, takeovers, autoplay videos, the things that, for me as a reader, I have to swat away in order to just, I just want to read the story. Get out of my way. Let me see the story. Uh, I'm still a subscriber to the Denver Post. It's practically, I mean, I, I support my friends and colleagues there, but the, the, the model is just awful. It's, it's practically impossible for me to read stories there because of all the, the obstacles that they throw up. So at the Colorado Sun, we decided, look, if that's what the old model looks like, that's you know, largely advertising supported, we need a new model. And if, it's, if that model isn't going to support a mature newsroom, we need to come up with something different. We came up with a, with a plan that is so simple that it sounds naive. Let's produce quality journalism. Let's treat readers with respect. If readers are going to be the ones who largely support us, let's give them the best experience that they can possibly get on our site. The Colorado Sun site is optimized for mobile. Even with a, if you had a crappy uh, uh, iPhone 4 and you were on Wi-Fi at the library, it should rock and roll for you. It should load quickly and, uh, and be clean. You're not going to see pop-ups and takeovers. You'll, actually, you'll, you'll see one pop-up at the Colorado Sun, which is saying, won't you consider becoming a member of the Colorado Sun? Once you become a member, you never see pop-ups again. That's my pledge to you. Um, so uh, again, uh, it's, it's a very simple model. It's largely uh, driven by, our revenue is driven by uh, paying members. Again, a very voluntary ask. There's no paywall. It's just if you believe in quality journalism and you want to support uh, locally owned journalism, uh, consider becoming a member. We do have uh, sponsors. You guys might call them advertisers, but it's a different kind and a different model of advertising. We're not on the digital treadmill that so many legacy newspapers are on that have to generate a bunch of page views to satisfy, uh, to satisfy advertisers. As I said, I'm not anti-advertising. I'm just anti-bad advertising. And, um, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not really anti-page view. I mean, we all like to get page views. It's fun to see our stories uh, resonate with readers, but we're really not in the page view business anymore. We, we left that behind. I mean, I know how to get page views. You want to know how to get page views? 
Anytime the zoo gets a new baby, you rewrite a press release, you post photos of the adorable zoo babies, and you will get a gazillion page views. And by the way, I love zoo babies for the record. I'm not anti-zoo baby either. But we're not in the page view business anymore. You know, we're in the loyalty business. And what that looks like for the Colorado Sun is, there's another metric. I mean, I, I watch page views as well because it's, you know, it is a measure. But the, the metric that I really watch is engagement. So over the course of the past three and a half years at the Colorado Sun, when people come to our site, they uh, are, well, first of all, anybody here, how long do you think your, your average reader spends on a story at a legacy newspaper? Anybody? Yes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Anybody else? Yep, that's right. About 30 to 45 seconds. That's how much time people spend on stories at legacy newspapers. It's kind of drive-by clicks, like, oh, what a cute zoo baby. I'm going to click onto the next thing, and you move on. At the Colorado Sun, the average time that people spend on our stories has been three minutes over the past three and a half years. And I like to joke that either we have really slow readers or we're producing content that connects with readers. And I, I think that's what it is. Also. Uh, our newsletters. Uh, we have a very high open rate uh, at our newspaper, uh, at our, with our newsletters. So that's what we're about. We're in the loyalty business. We are trying to produce content that connects with, uh, with readers, and um, so far they have, uh, they have responded. I'll say that, that one thing that uh, I'm particularly proud of is that, you know, beyond the awards that we won, is that we're demonstrating that there is an alternative, right? As I was mentioning to your dean earlier today, it's not smart again to bet against the hedge funds. It's not smart to bet against Alden Global Capital. I mean, they are enormous. They own hundreds of newspapers uh, across the country. Uh, Gatehouse, Gannett, same thing. It's not smart bet to bet against those guys. They don't have to win every time though. To me, we have choices as news consumers. We have choices as journalists. Again, I was senior editor. I could have stayed there. I could have continued collecting my salary and, and all the rest of it. I felt like there had to be a better way that, again, as I said before, journalism, in my view, is too important to be left in the hands of hedge funds that are interested in one thing and one thing only. It's not your communities. It's not newsrooms. It's quarterly profits. And as I said, I'm not anti-capitalist either. It's okay to make money, but if that's all you're about, then maybe you ought to be in a different kind of business. So I'm seeing, we're all seeing an, an amazing development that, that uh, frankly, I'm pinching myself to, to, to see these um, other uh, news organizations pop up around the country. It's not just the Colorado Sun, of course. It is uh, the Texas Tribune. Uh, they have been a tremendous uh, uh, model for the Colorado Sun. Evan Smith, uh, the one of the co-founder and editor uh, of the Texas Tribune, has come to Colorado and spent time with me and with my staff, and we've talked. They have provided incredible inspiration to me and to us. But it's happening around the country. Uh, there's Block Club Chicago. There is the Daily Memphian in Tennessee. There is, again, Lookout Santa Cruz and... Uh, Berkeley side, Oakland side, Cal Matters, a number of things that have popped up around the country. Some of them nonprofit, some of them like us, uh, public benefit corporations, some for profit. I, I know that there are some certain people uh, in the in the business these days who are fanatical on this question of you know all news should be nonprofit. I'm not one of them. To me, nonprofit is just a tax status. You know, frankly, uh, whether you're a nonprofit or for profit, you need to make money. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to pay your reporters and, and pay for the health care and the other things. Uh, tax status is, is another thing. To me, are you committed to your community? Are you committed to uh, the, the ideals that were laid out in the First Amendment? You know, those are the things that are important to me rather than the, uh, than the tax status. I mean, here in, in, uh, in Nebraska, you know, you've also seen uh, the Flatwater Free Press, the Nebraska Examiner. Uh, the Straight Arrow News, Nebraska Sunrise News, other things pop up. We may see more things pop up. 
Pointer says more than 70 local newsrooms launched in the United States in 2020 and 2021. More than 50 local newsletters started publishing in that same time. These digital startups are playing a vital role in our communities and in our democracy. When I visit uh, college campuses, I, I sometimes will uh, ask students like, okay, who here subscribes to a local newspaper? I'll try that here. Who here has a subscription to a local newspaper? A lot of times I see, you know, I'm, I didn't see a whole lot of hands out there and that's, you know, you guys aren't alone. Um, I, I hear that a lot and see that a lot. I was at the University of Colorado a while back and um, I asked that same question and then I, I picked on one young woman in the, uh, in the classroom and I said, well, you know, talk to me about that. Where do you get your news from? And she said, eh, from my news feed. Like, I don't know what that means. I mean, I, I get it, but I don't really know what that means. You know, when I, was, when I was growing up, news consumption was a very active act, right? You subscribe to your newspaper. Uh, we all pretty much watched the same network news programs with Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or whatever it was, subscribed to the, uh, or went to the corner store and bought a magazine, you know, that sort of thing. Today it's a very, feels like a very passive experience uh, for so many people, like this young woman that I was mentioning at the University of Colorado. You know, we're all hit with this fire hose of information and who knows what's real and what isn't, and, uh, and I, and I said to her, well, talk to me about that. Why don't you care where you get your news from? You know, shouldn't it matter to you where you get your news from? And she said, eh, news is depressing. I, it's just a downer, I, I, you know. And I said, well, forgive me, with all due respect, that's like saying you don't like food because all, all you've ever eaten is fast food. And what we're trying to do at the Colorado Sun and some of these other news organizations I mentioned is to serve you a fine meal. You know, the kind of meal where you maybe have a, you know, a nice cup of coffee and a glass of wine and dessert. And at the end of it, you push back from the table and you said, that was a meal. You know, you, that you feel like you, you nourished your soul. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with our journalism at the Colorado Sun. And I think that quality does matter. We, we were, I was just joking about t-shirts, you know. One of the things about uh, starting up a new news organization is, you gotta, you gotta have swag. We have t-shirts. By the way, you go to coloradosun.com slash store and you can get awesome t-shirts. Turns out there are a lot of choices when you uh, get in the t-shirt business. You can buy cheap ones that start falling apart the first time you wash them, or you spend a few extra bucks to get a nice t-shirt that feels good, that will, that will endure, and it, whatever abuse you throw at it. I said, you know what, if we're gonna slap a Colorado Sun logo, uh, on a t-shirt, by God, it better be a really nice t-shirt. So we're all about quality with uh, with everything we do, with our swag. Fabulous swag, by the way, coloradosun.com store, so feel free. Um, you know, I, I sometimes use uh, another food analogy when I think about media today. So, you know, back in the day, and, I mean, I, I guess this is still the case at, you know, large legacy newspapers. Large, your large leg legacy newspapers are sort of like a supermarket, right? You go in and you can get pretty much everything you need for tonight's meal, right? It's all under one roof. It's easy to do. Uh, today, when I think about the media landscape in Colorado and as I look around the country, it kind of looks a lot more like my old neighborhood in Brooklyn, where if you want really good cheese, you go to the cheese store. You want a really fine cut of meat, you go to the butcher. You want great bread, you go to the baker. And at the end of all that shopping, you come back with, you know, much higher quality food than you would have gotten at most supermarkets. And to me, uh, in the media business, at least, as I said, in Colorado, and I think this is true in a lot of other places, the Colorado Sun's not trying to be a mini Denver Post. We don't cover the Denver Broncos. We don't cover, uh, we don't cover the war in Ukraine. We don't cover the stabbing of the day downtown. Those are important stories for somebody. Our thinking about that, my thinking about that was, let the Denver Post do that. 
let TV do that. Let somebody else do that. We're going to do the stories that others can't do or won't do because they don't have the staff to do it or the, the commitment to do it. You know, we lean hard into doing investigative stories, explanatory stories, watchdog stories, long-form narrative stories, stories that are hard to do. We will love to go after public records and, and those kinds of things. So using this food analogy, right, if you, if you want the Denver Broncos, go to the Denver Post, go to the NBC affiliate, go to The Athletic. Uh, if you want education news, we do some of it, but Chalkbeat does an amazing job uh, of covering education news. So from my perspective, uh, news consumers have more choices than ever if they choose to exercise them. And I, I think it's worthwhile. If it, it is more trouble for news consumers to go out and fill your basket uh, from lots of different places, but um, I think there's a great, uh, there's a great payoff for, uh, for doing that. There's another exciting thing that, uh, a trend that I'm seeing these days uh, with uh, digital startups, a willingness to work together. We're, we haven't always been that great uh, in this business with working together. We're very competitive people. We throw elbows. Nobody loves to get uh, a scoop more than me. Um, it's awfully fun to have exclusive news. But, you know, as, as we've all gotten smaller, it's never been more important to work together, to collaborate, and to find ways to leverage our strength. So, for instance, quick story. Um, I guess it was maybe a, two years ago. It was maybe a little before the pandemic, we decided we wanted to take a look at affordable housing across Colorado. And uh, for tens of thousands of people across Colorado, mobile homes are the last form of affordable housing uh, for people in Colorado. But if you're lucky enough to own your own mobile home, chances are you do not own the land that it is on. And that means that you are now held hostage, uh, in some cases, uh, by your landlord who can evict you. Mobile homes, many mobile homes are not actually even mobile. Um, they're not, uh, it, it might cost you thousands of dollars even if your mobile home could be moved. So we decided to partner up with news organizations across the state. And, uh, and I mean uh, up in the mountains, on the plains, in the Denver metro area and elsewhere. And we knitted together a coalition of more than a dozen newsrooms across the state and produced award-winning journalism that none of us could have produced on our own. Even though the Colorado Sun is an extra large newsroom uh, with a, a staff of 25, we could not have pulled that off. Um, and that's the kind of collaboration that is just so exciting to me. We've done something else in Denver. The Colorado Sun is part of something called Colab. Colab is a collaboration among uh, dozens of news organizations across the state. In fact, we're all under the same roof. There's the Associated Press, there are uh, uh, radio stations, there's the Colorado Sun, and we're all together in one building under one roof, and it's, uh, it's been exciting. We've done some other uh, collaborative work together. To me, look, we will still compete uh, when it makes sense. Again, love to get an exclusive story. We'll do that when it makes sense, but we, don't, uh, we are stronger when we work together. And to me, at the end of the day, we're a public benefit corporation. We're all about serving readers, serving our state, doing the best stories that we can do. And um, I'm not going to let competition stand in the way of, uh, of doing that good work. That brings me to what perhaps gives me the most uh, hope for the future of local journalism. I'm seeing these conversations, and the, the dean and I were talking about this today. You know, five years ago, even, you know, there weren't these kinds of conversations about journalism as a civic good, right? I mean, journalists have never, are never going to win any popularity contests, uh, that's for sure. You've got to have a thick, thick skin to be in this business. But we've lost a lot across the country, uh, and people are starting to notice. They're starting to notice that uh, there's no coverage of their museum uh, exhibits or of their dance recitals or you know whatever it might be I've had I've had people in the uh, arts and culture uh, fields tell me look I'd rather have a bad review than no review at all 
because when there's no no review, people aren't coming to our shows. And uh, I've had ta I've had conversations with philanthropists and other groups who are finally starting to realize that journalism is part of our democratic infrastructure. And the fact that we're having those conversations right now gives me enormous hope for the future. And again, you know, not so long ago, those, those conversations just were not happening. There were, um, there were other journalists, many journalists who have gone before me and some of the others, fine journalists who tried to start their own uh, news organizations and thought, we'll just do great journalism and the dollars will flow in and it'll all be fine. It's not enough. It's not enough. Journalism is a business. It does take money. Again, whether you're a nonprofit you're for-profit or you're somewhere in between, like a public benefit corporation. We've had to uh, find ways to pay the bills. That doesn't mean we sacrifice our ethics or our values. We, we bring those things with us uh, in whatever channel we're, uh, we're in. But um, it is a business, and uh, we have kept that in mind uh, always. So I'm not here to, again, to advocate for any one kind of business model. You've got several fine examples uh, here in Nebraska, you know, the, and we've got them around, around the country. I'm not even going to say that, you know, the, the Colorado Sun model is the only way, you know, that a news organization can exist. Texas Tribune, again, has had tremendous success over the past 10 years. Colorado is not Texas. What works for them in Texas doesn't necessarily work uh, for us in Colorado. What works for us in Colorado might not necessarily work, work here in Nebraska. You know, I am here to say that it is incumbent upon all of us to work hard to try to find our own way, to find our own models. Nobody knows their local community better than the people who live in them. And uh, that's really uh, one of the, uh, the big takeaways. I will say that there are a few things that I think we've learned at the Sun that can be applied elsewhere. Um, again, treat people with respect. Uh, that means, you know, not necessarily monetizing them with every click. That means uh, giving them uh, quality journalism, listening to them, trying to be reflective of the community. These are things that, uh, that can work anywhere. So much has changed about journalism in the past 40 years. You know, typewriters have, uh, have gone away. The paste pot that I used to have on my desk and used, used to, uh, I, when I turned in a story, it was about this long, you know, when, when I would paste together the, uh, the, the paper that came out of my typewriter. The tools that we have today are tremendous. Uh, some would say, <laughs> I had a, a former boss, a former foreign editor of the Associated Press, who said, ah, technology has ruined this business. Used to be that you could go off to, uh, as a foreign correspondent, and disappear for three weeks and come back with a tremendous story. And now you can find people anywhere. He was the worst defender. He used to pick up the phone all the time and call people. He'd call me in the middle of the night in Moscow. What time is it there? Um, but I, the, so the, the tools have, have, never been, uh, have never been better. But uh, I will say that the, the, the tools are different, the platforms are different. I mean, I never could have imagined, uh, you know, TikTok and Instagram and the other channels that we, uh, that we publish on today. But the, the lessons that, uh, that, were, that were learned by me and others in journalism school 40 years ago are still true today. You know, as we used to say at the AP, get it first, but first get it right. You know, hold uh, the powerful accountable, speak truth to power. Um, all of those kinds of things were, uh, were valuable back then. They're valuable today. They'll be valuable for you in the future when you encounter channels and platforms that we never imagined. One, one final story. You guys have probably heard this before. You know, this is, this is kind of at the, at the basis of what journalism is, at least from, from my perspective. You know, the old story about the reporter goes into the editor's office and the editor says, look, kid, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. You know, that's, that's what we do in this business. We verify facts. And um, I'm just proud that uh, digital uh, news startups are uh, stepping in to fill those shoes, 
to fulfill that role that the founding fathers laid out for us so long ago and um, gonna keep fighting the good fight. So thank you very much. Thank you. If you could grab a seat here, we're going to have um, the format will be we'll have some questions by uh, our panelists here, three student panelists, and um, and then we'll go to some uh, questions from the floor. I'll pass out some index cards. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up, Nasrin. Nasrin Nara, Ahmad Zaki, Siddiqui, Rita Shmakova, all going to have some good questions. So. Why don't you start us off? Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Nasrin, N-A-S-R-I-N. Uh, glad to meet you, Mr. Rickman, and uh, all other fellows. Um, thank you. I learned a lot today, and I found out that you're in love with food. You resemble everything with food, and it made me remember my uh, time working in BBC in Afghanistan and we used to share everything in our morning editorial meeting and uh, after uh, at the end of the meeting the editor used to say okay now what do you think we should cook that our audience would love to have and I will never forget that so uh, yeah you you said that no, you produce content that click with the readers, like it meets the need of your audience. But uh, how do you find it? Like, how do you know that what your audience wants? Do you listen to them? How? How do you connect to them? And uh, like, what kind of uh, stories are priority for, for you? Like in a day, there are many things happening around and how do you choose? Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, there's there's the old saying about you know how uh, uh, an army can't go to war on an empty stomach, and um, that's true of newsrooms as well. Like every newsroom you'll ever encounter uh, will serve pizza on election night. It's just a thing. You know, <laughs> you've you've got to do it. So yeah, for me, journalism and food probably are uh, somehow connected. But um, look. Uh, listening to readers frankly I, I think that's part of the been part of the problem uh, with what we're seeing today with legacy newspapers that uh, again for a hundred plus years newspapers have been uh, subsidized by advertising right and um, readers have never really paid the full cost of what uh, uh, their newspaper represented it was uh, it was an advertising vehicle and you know what has happened uh, I think in the past 10 20 years is that newspapers became more and more dependent on serving advertisers and not readers and so again your hedge funds your all the global capitals and whatever came in sold off the buildings as I mentioned laid off the staff and now you've got a smaller staff uh, tasked with covering the same sort of community but really what that was about was you know cutting their costs and trying to squeeze more out of out of advertisers so it made it harder for newspapers to be connected with their communities you know when you when you don't have bureaus around the states and you're not going to city council meetings and you're not going to community meetings and not talking to people when you're more or less you've got reporters chained to a desk you know rewriting press releases you're not connected to your community you're not able to listen and to me that's been part of the tragedy of what we've seen over the past 10 years or so for us we you know we don't rewrite press releases that's not what we do that's not our model you know we are trying to go out and talk to people we do readership surveys I speak to community groups you know I encourage my reporters you know go out you know go out and talk to people it's so important to, to talk to people and listen and be uh, connected to your community because you know at the end of the day as I said advertising isn't supporting the Colorado Sun you know readers are and if we are connected to our readers if we're not listening to our readers we, we have no chance it, it is core to our business model to listen to our readers thank you 
thank you so much. It was very interesting listening to you. Uh, I went through the website of Colorado Sun and the part on, uh, as I had also uh, written to uh, the professor as well, I liked the section on housing. This was something a bit different than what we had seen with other newspapers. Now, throughout your speech and during your answer as well, you, you uh, mentioned hedge, hedge funds uh, several times. Uh, according to an, ana uh, an analysis by the Financial Times, more than half of U.S. Uh, newspapers are owned by hedge funds now. Um, how good of a news or bad of a news could it be for local newspapers? I think it's terrible news. I mean, uh, look, I mean, you guys know, I mean, hope you know, Alden Global Capital is making a play for Lee Enterprises. Uh, which could greatly impact you here in Oklahoma. I'm sorry, here in Nebraska. Where am I today? Um, look, uh, to me, hedge funds have done more damage to our democracy than just about any other group that I can can think of. They are interested, as I said, in one thing and one thing only. That's you know, bringing in as much money as possible. Journalism can be expensive. You know, it can cost a lot of money just to park a reporter covering a court hearing or to go after public records and that sort of thing. To me, the, uh, these hedge funds pose a, a huge threat to, to local news. I mean, the, again, the, the fact is when journalism jobs go away, it's sad. You know, journalists go find other jobs. You know, the people I know have gone to find other jobs. But those, but those, uh, those core functions that journalists fill you know, don't get filled. And frankly, uh, I didn't talk about it in my speech, but, you know, uh, last year, in fact, a year ago, practically a year ago today, uh, the Colorado Sun, a little digital startup, the Colorado Sun, we became co-owners of 24 community newspapers in Colorado. These are largely uh, weekly newspapers. And the reason I did it, believe me, it wasn't because I loved print so much. I mean, I do, I do love print but it wasn't really part of our business model. But we did it because if we didn't step in and buy these community newspapers, Alden Global Capital would have. And these are hyper-local hyper -local newsrooms that they're the only ones covering the county commissions and school boards and all of that sort of thing. And I just felt like I'm not gonna be able to sleep at night if I let Alden take over those newspapers when I could have done something to step forward and do something about it. So. I do think hedge funds pose uh, a huge threat to us all, and uh, that's why I'm trying to offer an, an alternative. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the speech and for answering this part of the question about acquiring 24 newspapers in Colorado, because that was exactly what I was about to ask you. So one of the questions, so since you started to answer it, how is the work going with them and what are you doing? How are you helping those newspapers to survive and how are you changing their models or are you what are you doing with them right now so it's been kind of interesting these these newspapers by the way weren't failing newspapers it was just uh and this is true all across the country there are lots of news organizations like this lots of mom and pop newspapers around the country who are owned by people who are getting up there in years and maybe they're maybe they don't have kids or maybe their kids aren't interested in uh in running the newspapers so they're looking around who's buying newspapers these days hedge funds pretty much so their choice in many cases is to sell to a hedge fund or to turn off the lights and um in this case uh, these folks came to us and said are you interested I mean, oh, you know i'm kind of busy right now but all right let's uh, let's do this so uh, we, we purchased uh, these 24 community newspapers with the help of the National Trust for Local News. The National Trust for Local News is a new uh, nonprofit that was put together precisely to help uh, keep newspapers in local hands, if at all possible. So uh, it's going very well, thank you. Uh, so far, the, the newspapers are continuing to make money, not a ton of money, but they're not losing money. As I you know, sort of jokingly say, uh, our, our number one mission was don't break anything. You know, they're making money, let's not mess with that. But I will say that, you know, like a lot of small newspapers, they were overly dependent upon print. Um, digital was really an afterthought for these newspapers, uh, definitely an afterthought for their advertisers. And, um, you know, that works for today. 
I don't know that it works so well for tomorrow. So part of our mission has been to reorient these papers, to continue doing print. I mean, I love print. Uh, we'll do print forever if, uh, if there's an appetite for it uh, among readers as well as advertisers, but to try to uh, boost their performance uh, digitally so that we could connect with younger uh, audiences. And, con you know, at the end of the day, look, you know, I'm all about the journalism, not about the platform. If readers want journalism, you know, that's uh, projected onto the side of a building, then I'm going to get really good at projecting stories on the side of a building because uh, it, it, the platform doesn't matter to me. I love print, but it's about connecting with people. It's about, uh, you know, doing good journalism. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, our, our newspapers uh, are making money. They have definitely uh, boosted their digital performance. Uh, I was able to hire, in fact, a, a former colleague from the Denver Post, who's now the publisher of, uh, of those community newspapers. We're having fun. I mean, frankly, one of the crazy things that we're talking about right now is, would it make sense for the digital Colorado Sun to have a print edition? Maybe. So we'll see. I mean, that, that would just be a crazy, uh, crazy uh, chapter uh, in the Colorado Sun's history if, uh, if we end up going from digital first into, into print. But who knows? You're welcome. I wanted to ask another question, but you mentioned you're still thinking about newspaper. And uh, I'm wondering why you think about newspaper but not like improving the uh, Sun Corrado, the Corrado Sun to uh, TV channel and radio station. Why you're not thinking about that? Well, uh, actually, uh, we're in talks right now with uh, KUNC which is a public radio station in uh, northern Colorado, to do a regular Colorado Sun segment, for instance. Uh, it was after a talk at the University of Colorado Boulder that we decided to launch a podcast. Uh, again, we love our Sun puns. So one of our, uh, our flagship newsletter is the, uh, is the Sunriser. Uh, our podcast is called The Daily Sun Up. So anyway, but uh, look, I, I'm all about different platforms. If it makes sense, if it made sense for us to have a TV studio, we would do it. I mean, so far, what do I know about TV? This, you guys know more about TV than I do. But if it makes sense for us to do it, I'm all about trying to reach people however they want to be reached. You know, my sense is that, you know, we're in a very competitive uh, TV market. Um, I think that the TV stations, um, uh, it would be tough for us to go up against them, but I will say that uh, we compete. It's been fascinating to me, just a quick aside here. So, you know, 50 years ago, it was really expensive to, to own a newspaper, right? You had to own a printing press and buy print by the barrel and all of that. Same thing with TV stations. You had to have all of this infrastructure and all the fancy gear and fancy cameras right now. Now with a laptop, you know, and some, some inexpensive uh, gear, you can do those things. But we are colliding online. TV stations are having to learn the skills that I learned early on, which is they ha they're having to write stories and produce stories on their own websites. It's not enough for them just to do video anymore at 5 o'clock and 10 o'clock. They're having to write stories and post stories throughout the day. We know that world really well. Newspapers and news organizations like ours are dipping our toes in the water of video. We do video when it makes sense for us to have video, but I don't know. I mean, it, frankly, it, it came down to choices. You know, I can do a lot of things so-so, or we can try to lean hard into doing what we do really well. And uh, I would love for us to be able to grow someday and to be able to do more video. Um, so, uh, for people who are interested in uh, uh, media, they usually start from uh, uh, a newspaper that covers like a state, a city, and then a countrywide, and also uh, like uh, international uh, uh, coverage. For you, it has been uh, the other way around somehow. So, uh, you spent four years in, in Moscow, and you helped in covering um, the fall of Soviet Union, and also the rise of... Uh, uh, new Russia. You witnessed history, actually. So um, now, uh, being or having spent four years over there, and now working for the Colorado Sun, do you ever miss 
having worked for 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 those uh, news organizations to be able to utilize your experience in those regions especially at the time where all the focus is on those uh, regions that's a great question thank you you know to me um i treasure the experiences that i had some of them were scary as hell honestly uh it's no fun to have uh helicopters uh shooting at you and uh, have rockets you know landing and seeing bodies in the streets you know i i covered the war in chechnya in uh, 1995 and i've seen firsthand what that looks like um yes it, it was it was exciting being a foreign correspondent but you know for me uh, it's exciting to be witness to a different kind of history, you know, on a more local level, you know, on the state level. And to me, look, journalism is about um, all the things that we've all learned about, you know, in classes. It is about, you know, watchdog, explanatory, s serving readers. And to me, uh, look, history was being made somewhere here in Nebraska today. Was there a journalist there to document it and write about it? Uh, that's, to me, exciting, to just do the best job that, that I can do and that we can do to connect with readers and to serve people and to help them understand. You know, in, in Colorado, you know, understanding is the word that, that I most uh, turn to when talking about the Colorado Sun, that we try to bring understanding to what it means to live and work and play in Colorado. That's, that's what we're about. And to me, that's a noble calling, whether you're covering a city council hearing or whether you're covering Russia's invasion of Ukraine is to document history, connect with readers and, and serve your community. While Rita's getting ready, I'm gonna come down and collect any questions you might have to request to you. I just wanted to follow up on the Zaki's question. Many young journalists are getting overly excited about the idea of going to report about big historical events, like being in the heart of whatever's going on. So actually being there and seeing what you saw, what would you recommend, suggest for those young journalists who are just, or not so young journalists, just in general, people who, how can you do your best and remain mentally stable and, I don't know, prof and professional and human after all? You know, that that's a great question. I will say that, you know, I have learned a lot in the past 40 plus years being in this business. And one thing I've learned is that way back when we really didn't do a good job of pre preparing ourselves uh, for the for the awful things, frankly, that that uh, that we often encounter in this business. You know, journalists against all reason. Sometimes we run towards danger rather than do the, do the wise thing and run away from it. You know, whether that's uh, a mass shooting, you know, I've covered more of those than I care to remember, or whether it's war. I, I will say that we had a mass shooting in uh, Boulder, Colorado a year ago at a, uh, at a supermarket. And um, some, of, uh, some of the younger staff members had a, a very difficult time with it. You know, it was just, it was, just a horrific scene as every one of these mass shootings has been. I've lost track of all the mass shootings that I've covered over the years. And I thought, you know what, let's, let's take a minute here. And we brought in some uh, mental health professionals and counselors, and we sort of did a debriefing uh, the next day. And frankly, it was the first time in my career that I had ever uh, participated in such a thing. Never had an opportunity. Honestly, when I went to war, cover war in the war in Chechnya, I was pretty much said, you know, I was pretty much told, look, here's your flak jacket, here's your helmet, don't get yourself killed. And, uh, and that was it. And I learned, uh, and I'm not saying this was healthy, it, w it worked for me professionally, I learned to put aside my feelings, you know, about what I was seeing, you know. It's sort of like a trauma surgeon, right? If you're a trauma surgeon, uh, could break your heart, you know, to, to take care of, again, mass shooting. You've, you've got all of these people coming in. If you stopped and, and just let the humanity wash over you, you, you wouldn't be able to do your job. And that was sort of the way that I viewed being a journalist. But I will say that wasn't always the, the healthiest approach. So to me, you know, my advice would be, yeah, 
Look, first, first of all, journalism isn't for everyone, particularly you know war reporting or some of the other things like that. Uh, but if if that's the path you're going to go down, yeah, you you need to be able to steel yourself and do your job in the moment. But you know, my advice would be to also take time to connect with your humanity later and allow yourself to grieve the things that you've seen and experience the things that you've seen. Uh, that's definitely been a lesson that I've learned. I will say that, you know, also news organizations in general have done a better job of training their people ahead of time to recognize security threats and understand how to operate in a war zone. Again, I kind of shudder to look back on the crazy things that I did. Uh, I mean, I learned along the way and, you know, learned a few things from uh, more seasoned war correspondents who are around me. But, um, you know, the fact is, if you're going to cover a war or anything else, you bring with you the things that hopefully make you a good journalism, the curiosity, commitment to, to fact and accuracy and, and all of those kinds of things. But, you know, it's, I, I understand the, the impulse to want to go and say cover Ukraine. Honestly, I've thought about it. Again, I've got friends in Ukraine. Uh, I've got journalists. I was mentoring a group of Ukrainian journalists before the uh, before the invasion, and you know it's heartbreaking to think of them uh, being refugees today. So I understand the impulse to go, but it's it's not uh, as glamorous as as you might think. It's a lot of hard work. I'll tell you w one quick story, and then I'll know we need to move on to questions. At the end of the day, when I was in Chechnya. At the end of the day, after seeing all the horrible things that I had to see every day, we went back outside of Chechnya to a neighboring uh, uh, area called In Ingushetia. And uh, we had a safe house there that AP had rented where uh, we had satellite dishes and working power and all those kinds of things. So the Washington Post and the New York Times, AP and others could file their stories and file their pictures. So we all filed our, fo our pictures and stories and whatnot. And then out came the vodka. Right, and back then, uh, photographers were still using film. And film, you guys may not know this, but film used to come in little plastic uh, canisters about yay, yay big. And we didn't have glasses for the vodka, so I will never forget the taste of vodka mixed with film chemicals in these, <laughs> in these little plastic containers. And you know, it's, we were all uh, toasting at the end of the day, and it was kind of fun and romantic at the time, but you know, we all realized how close each one of us came, how lucky we were to be able to uh, to come back alive. Might might limit you to short, real short answers okay. if we get to these. Um, regarding private ownership of newspapers, what is the most harmful part of bias that comes from private ownership of newspapers? Boy, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think we've seen some examples uh, of that. You know, your classic example is your you know your billionaire owner, who uh, I mean, frankly, we we know this from journalism's history. You know, William Randolph Hearst back in the di day decided you know he owned a string of newspapers and decided, well, look, if we need to create our own war, we're going to do it, and you can do that when you own uh, when you own a newspaper. Um, so, yes, I would say that uh, private ownership of a newspaper could uh, could lead to something like that. We've seen it in our history. We've, there are more recent examples that I won't get into. But, um, you know, to me, uh, I would rather have a passionate local owner than a dispassionate uh, remote hedge fund that actually couldn't care less what's in your newspaper. I actually think in, in many ways that's more damaging to our democracy than an activist, an activist owner. Interesting. Do you think we can ever switch to a fully consumer-supported news world? I would hope so. I, I actually, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I mean, the fact is, uh, I bet a lot of you, even if you don't subscribe to newspapers, you, I bet you subscribe to something like uh, Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or something like that. You understand the value of subscribing to something and get something back from it. And to me, uh, news is hopefully valuable enough for you to be able to understand like 
again, this shouldn't be a passive experience, and I'm not saying the Colorado Sun is necessarily, or you know, whatever news organization, but pick your news organizations, and there is value in, in being able to trust the information that, uh, that you're consuming. That's, to me, worthwhile, and I hope for the future that uh, there are more people who are gonna be willing to support uh, grown-up newsrooms. So why is it important to not have a paywall? You know, there were a lot of smart people who told me, oh, you gotta have a paywall. You know, all the smart kids, all the, all the cool kids have paywalls these days. And, and, and I think that there are some serious arguments to be made. Like, if your news is free, are you saying that uh, it has no value? Um, I, you know, I would say, um, again, in our situation, and maybe our situation was unique in Colorado, we decided not to put up a paywall. Number one, because I didn't, I felt that our news was important for people to be able to read whether they could afford to read it or not. That, that you know, again, if we're going to say we're serving a, a core function our, in our democracy, then it shouldn't only be for those people who can afford to, uh, to pay for it. Um, I understand uh, the arguments for having a paywall. In our case, we were a very new news organization, and um, our greatest challenge was in making ourselves known to, uh, to readers out there. I didn't want to put up an impediment to people being able to read our stories and getting to know us. So that's, uh, there, was, there was some self-serving element to not putting up a paywall, uh, but there's also a yay democracy a piece of that as well. Um, do most news organizations, in your opinion, market well or poorly to consumers? I think I'd have to say poorly, and I would include the Colorado Sun in that. I mean, it's a challenge for us. You know, how do I, uh, how do I reach people? How do I reach you guys, you know, or, or your equivalents uh, in, in Colorado? Um, you know, do, I, do we do skywriting? Do we take out, uh, you know, do we produce TV commercials? Or, you know, what are the things that, uh, that we need to do? And I'm kind of asking seriously. I mean, we've, uh, we've had success in doing some uh, paid marketing on platforms like um, uh, Facebook. Uh, we have uh, marketed ourselves on free platforms like Twitter and Instagram and, and others. Uh, we're going to we're going to have Colorado Sun bus uh, bus ads at some point. You know, we're we're trying all kinds of different things. Um, there are a lot of Coloradans who who still don't know about us, and I honestly don't know what the answer is. Um, you know, frankly, newspapers in general through marketing money out the window a long time ago and um, that have done a poor job of it. We're trying to get better at it. I just, honestly, I'm still struggling with, you know, what are the best uh, answers to be able to reach people? By the way, take note of his Colorado Sun tie. It's got a nice little image on it. It's the kind of thing you can get. Um, what significant stories has the Colorado Sun broken and why was it possible for the Sun to do that rather than the legacy newspapers that were so much bigger? Well, I mean, we've, we've broken a number of stories. I mean, early on in the, uh, in the pandemic, uh, we, uh, we were able to go out to all of the counties and figure out what was happening in the nursing homes. And um, we had more reliable numbers on what was happening with COVID in the nursing homes in Colorado early on in the pandemic than the state did. In fact, Governor Jared Polis uh, actually cited our numbers and criticized his own officials, his own administration, uh, for lagging in their count of what was happening. And yeah, the state could have done it or you know, legacy newspapers could have done it, but they didn't, and we did. You know, we saw an opportunity to go in. We've done, you know, a number of stories that I'm that I'm proud of. We have, uh, for instance, uh, in Boulder County, um, we knew that, and this isn't news to you guys. Uh, fentanyl has just been a scourge uh, across Colorado, and uh, we were tipped off that there had been a number of fentanyl deaths in uh, Boulder County that nobody was talking about. I mean, this was maybe a year ago now. And uh, we had to spend hundreds of dollars on public records and uh, f basically threatened to sue uh, to get access to records about, to document how many people in Boulder County had died from fentanyl overdoses. And nobody else had done that. Could somebody else have done it? Yes. 
but they didn't. So, um, you know, frankly, and I think one of your questions was about how do you choose? How do you make those choices? You know, we all make choices. I mean, editors, reporters, we make, cho we make choices every day about do we talk to this person or this person? Do we cover this thing or that thing? You know, for the Colorado Sun, again, as I mentioned before, we decided we can't do everything well. Let's pick a few things, pick our battles, and uh, dig into them, and hopefully we've chosen well. And you've also got talented journalists, and it may be that they're just a little bit better than the other guys, I suppose. You know, when you have a great staff, uh, everything else is easy. Um, by the way, I would mention that you did some outstanding coverage on the water battle between Colorado and Nebraska that I'd commend to everybody here because it's a really big issue and it's going to get bigger. And they were very fair in their coverage. You didn't do it like homers. It was really quite interesting. Um, do you see staff numbers in newsrooms increasing again in the future or do you think they'll stay stagnant or continue to decline? Well, I think that what we're seeing is a shift. Um, I, I mean, I... I don't have a crystal ball uh, any more than the rest of you do, probably. Um, I, I do think we're going to see further declines at legacy newspapers, legacy news, news organizations. But you know, the Colorado Sun, we doubled in size in the past, uh, in the past year. And uh, all of these other digital uh, startups that I referenced have created new jobs in journalism. So I think, I think we're seeing a, a shifting, a reorganization of journalism jobs. You know, my hope, again, if, uh, if these trends continue, where uh, readers see value in what we're doing, um, that we stay connected to our communities and we do a good job of listening and truly serving our communities. You know, my hope is that we can grow. The Colorado Sun today, as I said, has a staff of 25. I could absolutely see a scenario under which we're closer to 40 or, or 50. Um, I'm not gonna do that tomorrow because we have bills to pay and uh, we have a ways to go to work towards that, but I am optimistic about the future. Um, looks like we are getting close to the end. Um, and I don't wanna keep our guest here too much longer, but um, interesting question, I think it's kind of related. How do you connect to younger audiences and what kind of opportunities might there be for these folks at your organization? So, you know, back to, back to listening. Um, when I was uh, in Boulder talking to CU students, you know, some of them said, you know, I was asking, how, how do you consume your news? And a number of them said podcasts. And I, okay, well, we can do that. So we decided to create a podcast. Um, we're getting, you know, it's not a ton. We're getting more than 1,000 downloads a day of our, uh, sun, of our daily SunUp uh, podcast. That's one way. Our, our demographics on the podcast are much younger than uh, those who are reading stories on our site. I would say that being a digital-only news organization has its own demographic uh, uh, element. You know, the extremely old people, <laughs> older than me, uh, tend to gravitate more towards print than, uh, than online. So I think our audience is probably somewhat younger in general than, uh, than legacy newspapers. Um, frankly, uh, you know, it's, it's talking to, to students and talking to others about, you know, what they want. You know, do you want us on TikTok? Do you want us, you know, where, where can we best serve you uh, as a news organization? What can we do to help uh, engage you in what's happening? You know, you care about jobs. You care about the environment. You care about the cost of goods or gas or, or whatever it might be. How can we connect with you? How can we help you um, understand what it, you know, what it means to live in your community? Um, in terms of opportunities, yeah, we, we have... Uh, we have an intern right now from Northwestern. We've got a couple more who are gonna be starting with us shortly. Uh, paid internships, by the way. Uh, I feel very passionate about that. I was saying uh, earlier today that I'm maybe a bit of a communist when it comes to things like healthcare. You know, all of our uh, employees have healthcare. You know, nobody took a pay cut when they came to the Colorado Sun. Uh, we provide healthcare to anybody who wants it. Uh, our interns are paid. Again, I try to treat our readers with respect. I try to treat our staff uh, with respect. Um, I was so fortunate early on in my career to have had opportunities, to have had mentors who helped me. I feel, I mean, frankly, that's why I'm here today. Um, 
anything that I can do to help. So if, uh, if any of you are interested uh, someday in becoming an intern or coming to the Colorado Sun, we're hiring uh, three additional reporters uh, at the moment. I've posted one of them, but we'll be posting two more. But we're also looking for, uh, for interns, and they can come from video. They could come from radio or, you know, we, one of them has uh, data skills. So, you know, that, I would say just one other quick thing, and I know we're running out of time, but, you know, when I was heading off to school 40 years ago, you know, one of the other pieces of advice uh, I got other than from the journalist, don't do it kid, was from my father who said, you should get a business degree. You should get a, at least a minor in business, something to fall back on. And I said, ah, I'm not going to fall back. He was right. Sorry, Dad. Uh, he was right. It, you know, frankly, having a better understanding of business would have uh, helped me as a journalist. It certainly would have helped me as an accidental entrepreneur. I never set out to launch a news organization. I did it uh, more or less because I felt like the hedge fund uh, forced me to. Uh, it needed to happen. And um, having a better understanding of business and how that works uh, would be helpful for all of you as well. We have a bunch of really good questions that we were not able to get to, but I would encourage you to come on up. Maybe our guest will stay. Larry, uh, I'd be happy to Larry talk Rickman to will stay for a few yeah. minutes and answer some of those individual questions. And please join me in thanking him.